Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar uh, on the nexus of the laity and the Catholic Church today. Uh, I am Paul Jarzembowski. Uh, I work at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, specifically in the Secretariat of Laity, Marriage, Family Life, and Youth. Um, I'm going to serve as your facilitator and host today. Um, we're really grateful. This is this this particular uh, webinar series is a collaborative effort between the USCCB's Secretariat of Laity and the Catholic Apostolate Center. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd also like to introduce our guests. Um, in particular, um, I'm, uh, I'd like to just give a thanks to uh, to Father Frank Donio, who's he'll, he'll introduce himself in a second, but who is the director of the Catholic Apostolate Center, who's collaborating uh, with the USCCB on this webinar. So uh, thank you, Father Frank. But I'm going to ask our presenters just to introduce themselves first and then we'll dive into some prayer, and then we'll dive then into some conversation on this topic. So first I want to invite Archbishop Nelson Perez to, uh, to introduce himself, uh, then I'm going to ask Jennifer, uh, then uh, Hoffman, and then Father Frank. Uh, th thank you, Paul. Um, so Nelson Perez, I'm the Archbishop of Philadelphia. I'm back to where I started from, actually. I was ordained a priest of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia in 89, uh, where I served for... Uh, for 23 years as a priest of the Archdiocese. Uh, I was made then uh, auxiliary bishop of uh, Rockwell Center in New York. And uh, five years after that, was made the Bishop of Cleveland. And two and a half years after that, I was brought back a year and a half ago as the Archbishop of Philadelphia. Um, so kind of back home, back to the circle. I'm also chair of the uh, uh, USCCB Committee on uh, uh, Diversity, Cultural Diversity in the church. I also serve as the Episcopal Advisor for National Federation of Youth Ministries uh, as well. And I work with Hoffman uh, extensively on the Big and Quento uh, journey uh, that, that we did the, on behalf of the bishops when I was chair of Hispanic Affairs of the Bishops' Conference. So that's just a little bit about me. You keep yourself busy in short, correct? A little bit. Wonderful. Well, so nice to be with you all today. I'm Jennifer Ball. I'm the founder and executive director of Young Catholic Professionals. And about 11 years ago, God called me to quit my full-time job. I was working in the secular sphere to embark on an incredible journey that became YCP. Um, I really would have never imagined that, you know, we would now have a presence in 26 cities across the nation, including Philadelphia recently. Um, and we're really on a mission to encourage young people to embrace their faith and live it boldly in the world through community. So it's a blessing to be with you all, and I'm excited for the conversation. My, and uh, Hosman Ostino, I am a, a professor of theology and religious education uh, at Boston College, where I also have the privilege of being the chair of the Department of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry. Um, much of my work uh, has to do with research about how the Latino presence is transforming U.S. Catholicism at different levels, parishes, schools, organizations, and other structures of uh, evangelization and ministerial life. Uh, I also had an opportunity to work with Bishop uh, Perez, as he, as he indicated, and others in the process of the Fifth Encuentro of Hispanic Latino Ministry. Thank you. Right. Yes, thank you, Paul. And thank you, Archbishop and Jennifer and Hosman, for being a part of this. We're really honored as we start a series of webinars over the next several months. And this is really our, our beginning. What a wonderful way to begin. So I'm Frank Donio of the Palatine Fathers and Brothers. I am the founding director of the Catholic Apostolate Center and also the direct executive director of the Conference of Major Superiors of Men of the United States. And so it's a it's a really a blessing to be with you to be a part of this and to to talk about topics that uh, that I also teach and I teach I'm an adjunct professor at the Catholic University of America in pastoral studies and working primarily with with lay people but also in clergy and ministry and and these areas of, that we're going to discuss today are just very near and dear not only to my personal heart but also to the heart of the Palatine charism because St. Vincent Pallotti believed that everyone's called to be an apostle. 
And so how do we go about that? And what does that look like? And how can we make that manifest in the world? So looking forward to the conversation. Father Frank, thank you. Actually, you kind of set us up great for that. Um, and really, this what you've first of all, it's great to see all the different people who are introducing themselves in the chat. Uh, it's wonderful to have such a diversity of people across the United States who are definitely interested in this conversation. Um, I kind of like the title here, the nexus. Uh, uh, very, it's a very kind of uh, you know convergence type of word of the lady in the Catholic Church today. Um, it's kind of almost a, a, a no-brainer of sorts. I mean, the church is the people of God, and the laity are the people of God. So, um, so it's kind of a redundancy, but it's a good conversation to have, especially in light of this uh, of the synodal process that Pope Francis has invited the church to enter into over the next several years. Um, and part of that synodality is walking together, journeying together. Um, first of all, between bishops uh, and, and their people, between uh, the clergy, the ordained, and the laity, and the religious, um, between people of different types of lay callings in the church, different apostolates, all working together towards the common goal of the kingdom of God. So, um, so that's part of the reason why we're having the conversation. And if you join us throughout the rest of this year, which we hope you might over the next couple of months, uh, you'll find that we're going to talk about different nexus points or different intersection points uh, of how different groups are working together, journeying together as the synodal documents have have encouraged us to to do. Um, how how they and sometimes when we journey together, sometimes we're we're walking side by side, sometimes one ahead of the other, sometimes we're sharing, sometimes we miss each other. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about some of these things over this course of this year. Um, but as you can tell from the different panelists we have, each of them have an insight to share of how we see this notion of the laity and the church today um, from different dimensions. Um, so you, you've heard their introductions. Um, I'd like to dive into some, some questions with them. And then what we're going to invite you to do is we're going to invite you as well to ask questions. So we've got a few that we've already started thinking around, um, but we really want to hear also what are your questions, maybe some things that might be inspired by what they say, um, maybe something that as you're coming into this conversation you really wanted to ask. So there's different ways, and, and our moderators in the chat will certainly be uh, receiving those uh, those questions from you as well. So, um, so I'm going to dive into, just to kind of get us started, um, and, uh, and Jennifer, I'm going to start with you um, with this, um, and then we'll move around. And we want this to be dynamic. It'll be kind of conversational, so uh, we may go in different orders as we go forward. But I think the first question I really want to talk around is what is the role of the lady in the church these days regarding the importance of lay ministry and lay apostolate? in the work of the church today. And those words, as we go through it, we may have different, we, we're gonna probably wanna define them as we go through. So, but as you understand the role of the laity in the church today regarding the importance of lay ministry and the lay apostolate in the work of the church. So so Jennifer, why don't we start us off um, and then um, and then I'm gonna move then just to, so I, then actually if Father Frank, you would also kind of give some enlightenment, that would be very helpful. Cause I think you also can help us share a little bit about how you see these terms, especially as the Apostolate Center, they're working through them. So, but Jennifer, let's start with you. Absolutely, thank you. And you know, as you were speaking, Paul, I, I was thinking of a quote from Pope St. Paul VI. He said, modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And so, you know, this is obviously a very important concept for us in young Catholic professionals. Our slogan is working in witness for Christ. And I think the laity through their lives are called to witness to the joy of the gospel. And so, you know, many times it's through apostolates that the laity kind of can find that, that purpose for their lives, discern God's will and how they can live out their unique plan for the kingdom. Um, so I just want to share a story with you that I think illustrates this topic. Uh, Michael Kelly is one of our members that we talk about a lot. We met him at a secular event in the city and we invited him to a YCP happy hour. He was totally disengaged from his faith. He hadn't been to mass in 10 years. Well, it was through this event, this YCP happy hour, that he was then invited to a speaker series 
And then he really developed friendships within this YCP community. And he credits the people that he met, the friendships, to really transforming his faith, coming alive in his faith. Flash forward to today, he's now married to a woman he proposed to in adoration, and he's deeply involved in the life of the church, serving his parish and serving the diocese. And so I think you can see that it's it's really the laity um, that provided that witness to Mike through the context of an apostolate. So I think long story short is that the laity are called to serve God by their lives and, and really draw in their fellow men. And many times it's the apostolates that create that space for them to connect with one another and more fully discern God's will for their lives. Thank you, yeah, that's really good. Father Frank, specifically, and maybe you can also talk a little bit about how you would also define those terms before we get too far down the, the road. Uh, because we're going to be throwing words around like lay apostolate, lay ministry, uh, the laity, lay ministers. Um, so as you're kind of, as we kind of are looking through those terms, maybe you can kind of even kind of guide us through some of that because um, I know you're working. Um, and also kind of even respond to what Jennifer was saying. How does even the notion of the witness um, kind of play into that uh, as you see it? Well, witness and mission are, are central, and this is what we're we're engaged in in, in terms of of all going forth. And, and Pope Francis speaks a great deal, and and certainly the, the we we go back to to the Second Vatican Council, the decree on the apostle of the laity, and of course the Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the Church. We see that the the call, universal call to holiness, the baptized, the the movement outward, and then this has just been been reaffirmed by every single pope since then. And here in the United States, we've seen this blossoming of ministries, ministries within the, the church context, but also lay ecclesial ministry, this term that we've used here in the United States. Some other countries use the term pastoral workers for similar people who are formed, who are authorized to, to uh, stand in the name of the church in a variety of contexts. We also have then these ministries that people take on within their church communities. But then there's this other word that I think at times has gotten lost in the lexicon of the church in, in more recent years, and that's the term apostolate. And, and sometimes I think people wait for an authorization from the church to go forth. And there's no, the authorization is baptism affirmed in confirmation, Here, here's this authorization as a, a lay person to go forth and that the church's ministers are about assisting, being present. I, I, I'll never forget the, the homily. I was doing the uh, commentary for the live stream. It was in Archbishop Perez's cathedral uh, back, uh, what now, six years ago when Pope Francis was saying, you know, he was talking about St. Catherine Drexel and and he, he takes that story and he says, you know, to everyone who was there and beyond, what about you? And that shared responsibility for the mission of Christ in the church is, is key. And it's not just on the church campus. It's out and about. It's in everyday life and all these places. Now, we've been saying this. We have all kinds of official documents for the last 50 years. But it still hasn't really permeated in a way that that can be, I think, at times, uh, a way that, that that truly is really what Pope Francis is talking about a great deal, and, and which has come to us from, from the experience of Latin America, the term missionary disciple. The Quinto Encuentro and, and Archbishop Perez was very much in, involved in the in the preparation of that. You know, Latin, you know, the encounter with Christ, accompanying, and then going forth, you know, here, here from the community of faith, but returning to the community of faith. All of these things are, are, are aspects of what we're, we're talking about when we talk about lay ecclesial ministry, which has a particular formation authorization, lay ministry, which has uh, an engagement primarily within the church community, but even moving outward, but authorized officially, more officially by church. And then lay apostolate, which baptism has as an, its authorization to go forth. Well, and, and I'll, next, I want to really kind of move to Hoffman because you, you, your work, you get to work with, you know, training and forming in the university setting. Many of those lay ministers and many of the lay people who come in and you, you kind of send forth, uh, fully formed, hopefully more formed 
uh, than when they arrived um, into the world and into the church. So um, maybe what what your, your perspective would be very interesting on this again, what you see as the role of the laity, uh, the lay ministry, the lay apostolate. Um, how how do you how do you work with that? I certainly affirm, you know, what uh, what Father Frank was saying uh, about the connection uh, to baptismal uh, or to baptism, to this baptismal identity. Uh, my sense is, you know, perhaps my, my best contribution to this conversation is looking at the role of the laity from the perspective of vocation. And I think that that's exactly what the Second Vatican Council did, you know. It was a clear reminder to all the baptized that we have been called, called to holiness, without a doubt, you know, but to activate, to enable that holiness to transform our lives and to transform the world. And that is a vocation that is not negotiable, as a matter of fact, for all the baptized, you know? So we are all baptized. And, and it seems to me that we often forget that any conversation about apostolate or about uh, lay ecclesial ministry or ordained ministry and other forms of ministry uh, began precisely by acknowledging the fact that we are baptized women and men, disciples of Jesus Christ. And it is in this you no know, discernment about vocation that then we position ourselves, you know, in the context of the everyday, in the context of history, and then find ways to actualize you no know, that calling in the different ways in which God is calling us, uh, you know, to, to to live and serve, you know. For some of us, it might be as theology professors or uh, catechists or youth ministers or priests, deacons, about religious, depending on you know the calling that God is uh, is making in our lives. But I all I always tell my students, you know, before we go into the history of lay ecclesial ministry or the theology of the priesthood or anything else. Let's take a big, big tour on the you know, on, on the theology of baptism and begin there because the more we fall in love with our baptism, the more we understand our role in the church, our vocation in the church as lay women and men. And from there, you know, we can take it in, in many other directions. Oh, that's a great, yeah, baptism is definitely, and I think that that speaks also to the witness that you know the the because in a way the witness that jennifer speaks of the witness of your lives it kind of emerges from that and you're called by baptism to to be my witnesses you know so um as the lord says archbishop you've heard a lot of this stuff already and you obviously get to uh work in an archdiocese where you have many lay ministers whether it's they're, they're called as such or not but you also have many people who are involved in the lay apostolate in philadelphia but you've also been around the country and doing things on, at the USCCB and other dioceses. What's been your experience, the role of the laity as you, as, as a bishop, uh, have been able to see? Well, I, I, ha I have to say that um, when I hear things of like, uh, that people say, well, you know, the, the, the laity need to, the, the church need to take the laity more into consideration as if they don't have it. I could only speak from my experience. I had never known a church where the laity weren't front and center, right? It might have been like that in the 50s, um, but I wasn't around in the 50s, right? So uh, I was born in 61, so I'm a post Vatican II church product, right? So ever since I was a kid, yeah, the priest had his role, you know, behind the altar and, and as a leader of the community. But I must say that even as a, as a kid, and then as a as a priest, and as a pastor, as a as an auxiliary bishop, as a ordinary now as the archbishop, I haven't known a day where the laity have not been an integral part of the work of the church. It, it's already here. Um, it's already here at different levels, right? Um, YCP Philly is an example of that and an expression of. Uh, while I, yes, I was the one who called Jennifer and said, I want you to guys come over. Uh, it wasn't clergy directed, right? It was the spirit that moved them to then 
uh, get together a local team that came out to an inaugural event a few weeks ago that had 400 young adults out, right? I just walked in at the end and said, man, you know, it was all done by Jennifer and her local team and, her, and the identification of leadership and AC, their president. So I don't, it, it, I'm so, sometimes I'm a little like, hmm. you know, the reality is the lay have always been here. And I could have never done what I did as a pastor of St. Harris's if it wasn't the lay It was impossible. It's not like I was in a parish and I had 50 priests and none to keep it. Uh, in most of those parishes, well, I was the only pastor. And I might have one or two priests with me as assistants. The work of that community was, by and large, except the sacramental work, was done and put in the hands of the laity. So I haven't known a church, right, that was so centered on 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 that included the liturgy, the laity. I always saw the laity there, as I was too. So I'm going to kind of jump from that because one of the, like, so thank you all for kind of like painting this initial picture of how you see the role of the lady as witnesses emerging from baptism as a part of the apostolate um, and as a presence in the church that just is, it's just, it's the, it is the, 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 the vast church that is there. Yet at the same time, and I don't mean to, I, 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 I'm gonna take this beautiful picture that we've painted though, and I wanna offer a challenge because obviously there are people and, and, and Archbishop, you may note that some people do obviously see there is some struggle there. There is a tension. Um, so, I, and I, 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 I'm just gonna give the benefit of the doubt to the majority of people out there that it's not just an invented kind of tension that's there. So there are obviously tension points where either people feel that their voice is not heard, that they that the laity don't feel like they have a role in the church, even though they are they're just by numerically present, there's still a pre, a, still a feeling that that even despite their numbers, um, there is this this feeling that they aren't heard. So how do we wrestle with these tensions, and how do we acknowledge that there are certainly cases where these tension points do come up? Because um, I don't want everyone to think that the church has just been like, oh, everything's great. Let's close the webinar out. We're all good. Because there obviously are going to be some things. So I don't know how anyone wants to tackle that. And I don't mean specifically for to respond directly to the archbishop. But if other people want to tackle that kind of question about where do these tension points arise from and how do we, where do we, what do we, what do we, what are we thinking around those? So anyone want to jump in on that? Let, oh. let, let, let me offer a, a, a couple of thoughts here. In, in, actually inspired by what uh, Bishop Pettis just, uh, Archbishop Pettis just said, you know. Uh, I think that there is a, a cultural element, you know, that needs to be taken into consideration. I was born in Latin America, in which, you know, the idea of lay ecclesial ministry, at least when I was a younger person, I'm still young, you no. Know, uh, was uh, was almost unheard of, you know. I mean, the idea of someone hired to do ministry, you know, while being a lay person and so on, uh, that, that was more difficult. In the United States of America, when we engage in conversations about lay ecclesial ministry, we get caught up on the whole question of power and authority. You no, know? we get caught up on the idea or who makes decisions, who doesn't make decisions, whether it's a clergy person or whether it's a lay, lay person. And I think that there is value to those questions because as Vatican II also reminded us, and, and actually the Code of Canon Law is, you know, it opens the door for lay people to participate you know, in the governance of the church in, in, in some ways. You know? I mean, at the end of the day, evangelization is the, is, is the, is the task of the entire church. But something that gets lost in the equation sometimes is that, you know, if we could, could imagine two categories to an, analyze this dynamic, we can imagine oh, you know, the idea of ordinary ministry and extraordinary ministry, you know, 
ordinary ways of serving and witnessing and extraordinary ways of witnessing. Many, many conversations about lay ministry and about lay apostolate over focus on the extraordinary dimensions. Who gets to be a priest? Who gets to be a lay ecclesial ministry minister? Who gets to decide or not decide? But what we lose sight of many times is the ordinariness where most of us actually live in terms of uh, our ministry. Now, Jennifer, you, 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 you talked about, for instance, uh, Eucharistic adoration and witnessing in the everyday. I want to think, for instance, of the, you know, as a parent and as a spouse, you know, I want to think of the ministry or the ordinary ministry of being a, a father, you no, know, every day and being, and, and being a spouse, of being a teacher, being a driver, taking my kids up back and, you know, back and forth from one place to another. No, the, witness, the, the ordinary ministry of helping others, feeding other people, taking care of the sick. So I think that maybe, you know, in this reflection, as we, uh, as we think of this dynamic of, you know, in, in, a, in a way of affirming the role of the laity, we need not to forget the extraordinary ways of serving and doing ministry, but affirm more the ordinary ways that are the standard for most of us. I love that, and I maybe I'll go next if if that's all right. But I, I like that you said that about the ordinary um, the ordinary ways, and really that's kind of a huge part of our our mission is just by the ordinary everyday moments of our lives we can give glory to God and and serve Him, whether it's sending an email at work or working on a spreadsheet or through the witness to our coworkers, um, and in that way we are furthering the work of the church by simply being virtuous um, servants of the Lord. So I think that's a great point um, that you brought up. The other thing I thought of, Paul, when you mentioned this tension, I think it's just simply that sometimes the laity don't know how. They don't know how to engage. They don't know how to speak um, to their pastor. They don't know how to get involved in the diocese. You know, I see that very frequently with young people. Um, I'll just share one example. Uh, Diana Rodriguez is a young woman in San Diego, and she is what I would call a, a practicing Catholic, very engaged with her faith but passively involved in the life of the church she was. Um, so, you know, never really spoke to her pastor, didn't, wasn't involved in the parish life, wasn't involved in the diocese. Well, she started to get engaged with young Catholic professionals and then ended up becoming the president of the chapter. And through that experience, ended up learning how to manage a budget, how to do public speaking, how to work with volunteers. And she became so kind of uh, confident in this that her pastor started to ask her for advice at the parish. Then she ended up being an MC for their fundraiser. Then the bishop asked her for her kind of strategic expertise for diocesan-wide projects. So now Diana is integrally related into the life of, of the church there in San Diego. And it all started with just kind of that practice and that avenue. And so I think sometimes um, apostolates, at least that's what we hope to do, with YCP and maybe Father Frank, you could shed light on this as well. Um, I think sometimes apostolates can provide an avenue for the laity to engage with the church and kind of help them um, with that next step. I think to your point, Jennifer, about the, the, there's the aspect of invitation and also participation. An invitation, uh, you know, the, the guys dress like me uh, in terms of the, the people who are, who may be pastors, uh, the people who are also lay ecclesial ministers when they're parish, sometimes we become comfortable with the people who are involved. And rather than making more, more of an invitation and participation, I think there's also some underutilized aspects of, of structures that we already have, parish pastoral councils, finance councils, where expertise can be also brought in to the to the decision making and, and a greater consensus. But that also requires good formation of, of clergy as well as laity as to who has what role, what is it that we, we go about, how do we go about these things? And, and that the difficulty at times with so many different needs that there are, the challenge is, is to stay with, you know, Pope Francis talks about an evangelic gaudium, what, what uh, some have called the seven last words of the church. We have always done it this way. 
and just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean that we we can't make that and and to have that pastoral conversion that he talks about I and mean, part of that pastoral conversion we look at the synod and those words of the synod participation and communion and mission and when we're living that when we're living those things it, it creates greater co-responsibility but each person has their their own particular role and I think that's when the tension comes in is that, well, no, no, I want your role or I'd like you to have maybe a more subservient role or whatever it is, it, depending on who's talking at any given time. And so I, I do think that there are, are uh, uh, opportunities for invitation and also for participation, particularly invitation of young people. I, uh, I was intrigued also by what uh, Dr. Spino was talking about about the ordinary living out of ministry and then the, or the extraordinary living out of ministry um, and about the, the, the participation in decision making and, and power structures. But I was reflecting on, the, on right now the Archdiocese of Philadelphia as well as my experience in the Diocese of Cleveland. Uh, in both those places, listen, the reality was that most people that were in decision-making authority in different ministries of the Diocese of Cleveland and the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, where I am now, are not the case. Most people that are here right now in this building where I sit, there's 220 people working, right? Only about eight of them are clerics. The directors of Office for Youth Ministry, Youth uh, Education, uh, social, all the ministries in the church, they're not priests. They are lay people. Right? So to say that lay people don't have access to authority and decision making, the daily operation, I don't run the Diocese of Philadelphia daily. Actually, in some ways, my role is pretty limited, right? I don't know what's going on in the church of Philadelphia in this building today. I really don't. I I just got out of a meeting and I'm dealing with one little aspect of it. But there's a whole life of human dynamism that has been happening this day in this building in 13 floors, of which I'm only a little tiny part of. That's reality. And 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 most of the people directing the, the apostolate of the church from the diocesan perspective here today are they. They're, they're, they're not even nuns, they're not even deacons, they're lay people that have brought to bear their gifts like that woman, uh, Diana, in, in San Diego. Uh, different parishes will happen in different ways, right? Depending on, on the organizational. But, but I think we also need to celebrate what we have. You know, yeah. the church has called us a synodality, right? But and I look at the United States in terms of that, we didn't call it a synodal process, but the fifth and twenty was profound synod. It was the consultation of close to 300,000 in dialogue, 5,000 something Irish president. And if that wasn't synodal, uh, I would like to say to the Holy See, here's a structure for synodality called the fifth and quinto look yes. at it you know we we actually in the united states have uh a lot of the stuff that the holy father is actually calling us to i don't know if they, if they see it that way but and if the fifth and quinto wasn't a cynical process then what is what was or what is it? well and i i appreciate you know father frank spoke before about the co-responsibility you're speaking of synodality he speaks of this kind of this relationship and um and and jennifer it's not lost on me that you keep you keep using references of relationships that you've had and 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 that these that this uh, the stories you're sharing so thank you but one of the things i i'm curious about is how can the ordained and the religious support um and make known their distinct ministry within the church while also supporting the laity in their work in the world and in the church so 
you know, and maybe I'll maybe Father Frank, I'll pivot to you first, because as as a member of the ordained and and the religious, um, you know, how how do we make how do how would you make known your distinct ministry while also acknowledging? I mean, I know that what you do personally, but maybe your advice for what can be done, and then I also kind of ask some of the uh, some of my fellow lay people on the call also their thoughts on how we how we distinctly make known our roles while working collaboratively, synodally, and, uh, you know, co-responsibly with one another. Father Frank, I don't... I, I, think, I think it's to, to accompany, to walk together with. It, it's not necessarily this, that, that difficult to do, but I think sometimes people make it difficult. They'll make these very distinct separations uh, in which we we don't recognize how we are we are together, but also that we're forming one another. I'm formed by the by the people I work with every day, whether it's Catholic Apostle Center or at the university or at uh, or in the the Conference of Major Superiors of Men, and it's primarily lay people I'm encountering. And so I'm formed as a as a religious as a priest uh, in in that in the everyday encounters, and I think that that happens. In, in any when I when I do spiritual direction of priests and religious, and they'll talk about you know the way in which they're they have been formed by people that they encounter in everyday life, in everyday ministry, and the same thing with lay ecclesial ministers. But I think if we're it's not so much a focusing in on our on ourselves or roles and as it is how. Are, are people who are engaged in any of the church's ministries and apostolates, how are they, how are we engaged in assisting others in a greater encounter with Christ in and through the church? So as to go forth, that, that there's a, that, that continual going forth and not creating this happy little club that's, that's there. And we all, all feel good about ourselves, but instead are, are, are able to, to come into greater community with one another. And I think priests and religious, that this is a key aspect of, of what we're, we're called to in our particular ministries and works. But I'd say also anybody, who, any lay person who's doing ministry within the church, it's the same, that that there is this, uh, that we're, we're not just simply trying to fill out our programs or or look at our, our only our, our particular numbers, but how are we serving? How are we at the feet of others? How are we present to others? And, and they may sound that may sound very aspirational, but I do think it, it's it's so central and something that we we see witnessed in in Pope Francis, for example, in the way in which he goes about he's been going about his ministry and then listening in the in the way in which he's calling others to go forth. And I, I think that that's a, a good example, but I think we're, we see it in, in a variety of quarters within the church. Well, I like that you, you know, the, one of the first steps to worrying about and, 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 and naming this this relationship is first is the selflessness of, of looking at the other first. You know, I think of in Christus Vivit, Pope Francis spoke of, you know, our vocation has to ultimately be boiled down to service, how we serve one another. Um, and that is ultimately what we're called to do in this world is to figure out how we are there for the other, for, you know, and, and so how is the priest looking out for the lay? How is the lay looking out for the priest? How can we look out for one another in this context? So I, I appreciate the kind of, the first thing is to focus not on ourselves. <laughs> so Hoffman or, or Jennifer, any, any thoughts on, on this? Well, one thing that, uh, you know, I, I want to return to one of my original uh, ideas at, uh, at the beginning, not because it's one of the brightest, but simply because it grounds me in my thinking. But uh, I think that this question, is, I, I am you know, uncomfortable sometimes, you know, engaging in conversations about differences, you know, the, the how different is the ministry of the, of the ordained and the different of the lay people and so on. And it's necessary to make differences, you not know, to differentiate. But I think that any conversation about the differentiation among the different ministries and callings, vocations in the church, needs to begin by an affirmation of what you know, of what is that unites us, where everything begins. 
earlier I mentioned uh, definitely baptism, you know, our faith in Jesus Christ and we participate in his, in the Paschal, uh, in the Paschal mystery. I think that also we need to you know, keep in mind, you know, that there is only one mission in the church. That's it. It's, it's the mission of Jesus Christ. You know, it's the mission of evangelization. And we all lay ordained, you know, participate in this particular, uh, in, in, in this particular uh, ministry. Of course, each of us has their own vocation, you no, know, and, and, their, and their own particular, particular ways. But I think that the more we grow in consciousness about an awareness about uh, the one mission of the church, then we find ourselves supporting one another, as Father Frank actually was, well, you know, j j just just mentioned, you know. And actually, Paul, if you allow me, I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on a question that Bob McCarthy asked on the chat, you know. And he says, can the panel speak to the opportunity that the upcoming synod process will provide to amplify the voice of the laity? Okay, that's an excellent question. And I and I want to actually address that particular question and the question that you just asked. From the from precisely from this particular perspective, many people are reading this are reading synodality, you know, the process to which we all have been invited as a church as an exercise of listening. Okay. And then we need to start asking who's gonna listen. And here is where I'm seeing a lot of mistakes. Many people are thinking that the synod is an opportunity for the for the laity to speak so the clergy can listen. And that's where we got it wrong. It is an opportunity for all of us to listen to one another. Laity listening to the laity, the clergy listening to the laity and the, and the clergy, the laity listening to the clergy and, and, and so on, you know? So our voice is amplified by listening to one another. And I wanna go back to uh, Bishop Perez's uh, uh, experience you know, or naming the fifth encuentro process. No, nearly 300,000 people, mostly Latinos, Latinas, participated in the process of the fifth encuentro process. In so, and something that I liked most about that, uh, that process was not the big gatherings or the documents that came out, you know, and Bishop and, you know, and I were involved in writing many of those things, you know. But the most fascinating piece was to see groups of lay people speaking with one another with their pastors, listening to one another, to their pastors, pastors listening to their communities. That, I think that that's the key, you know, those dif differentiations that sometimes tend to divide because it's the only language that we have inherited, you know, or the main language that we have inherited, somehow, you know, comes together. They come together in the idea of listening to one another in communion, in light of that vocation or or that mission that we all share. I think that was extremely well said. I'm up to the next. I apologize. Okay, I'll, I'll pass on. That's fine. Um, and, and thank you all. And, 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 and so I'm going to dive into some questions. We've gotten a lot of questions coming in. And, and, and Hoffman, you started us off by asking one, answering one of the questions already um, about how we can. I think it's a very good point that we've raised. Um, one question that's come in, some terminology. Um, can, can you share the differences between what we mean by lay ministry and lay ecclesial ministry? Um, anyone want to tackle that one? Well, let me say that I've had a little experience with both, right? So that when I went to um, to Cleveland, there was a lay ecclesial ministry program in which a limited number of people uh, in the big scheme of things went through a three-year uh, process of training and formation and were at the end of that process commissioned formally as lay ecclesial ministers. Um, and then they, some of them took them positions in parishes. Uh, um, some of them even paid positions as pastoral associates, or youth ministers, or what have you. Um, in Philadelphia and in Rockville Center, that didn't exist. That doesn't mean lay ministry didn't exist, right? Uh, in, in a sense, I think that's where 
the even the term lay ecclesial ministry could be confusing because it's used in different places in different ways and defined in different ways. In Cleveland, it meant something very specific. It meant that they had a badge, they actually had a pin, right? That distinguished, right? Um, I got actually in trouble a little bit at Cleveland because at the Christmas Mass, I spoke about the gathering of the church together with the bishops and the priests and the deacons and, and the priesthood of the of the faithful and, and the laity. But I didn't mention lay ecclesial ministers, so I got letters, right? Well, I, my, I didn't have any experience of that because to me, ministry in the church uh, as Dr. Ospino has said, is an, an apostolate and being sent and discipleship is not rooted in a program. It's rooted in a sacrament. It's rooted, I am a minister of the church in the world by virtue of my baptism. That some will go on in a limited capacity, limited number, to a more formalized training and, and do that in a certain way. You know, not everybody in the most people in the church are not a doctoral student who has advanced degrees in theology and is a theologian. But everybody, in a sense, is a theologian because we all have a word about God, right? We all say a word, which is what theology means, right? So we all do theology, not in the way that he does it as a theologian within an academic setting. Um, so it depends how you use that word because that word here in Philadelphia isn't technically used that way. So I think I think we have to have clarification of terms because it's, it's sometimes it's they're used interchangeably, right? And I don't know if that's a good thing. Yeah. So now, and we're also aware that the so and and in two thousand and five. Uh, the U.S. bishops did put out a document on lay ecclesial ministry where they define it. But as you said, from diocese to diocese, the uh, implementation of that can differ. So, um, but um, but that's certainly one guide that may help. Another question that's come in uh, is in regards to the invitation and participation. How do we take into account the individual's charisms? Um, so often we, you know, the person that says, so often we rely on the same people and we don't take their charisms or gifts into account and we end up burning them out because we're reflecting what our needs are rather than where, what, what gifts they bring to the conversation. Um, would anyone like to speak to that? I think it's a discernment in how we can assist people in discerning what their particular charisms are because if it's a charism it's meant to be for others it's meant to be for the church for the world for it's not it's not meant to be self-serving and if that's a gift of the holy spirit then it, how do we assist people in in recognizing what you know arising from this vocation of baptism as uh, dr espino has, has mentioned and how do we recognize how the Holy Spirit is is moving within this individual it, and help it, not only our recognition, external recognition, but internal recognition and discernment of, okay, now what, what do I do with this? I, I've come, I, I'm come to an understanding that this may be something that I, and, and what are the moments and places and spaces in which that can, can occur? For some people, it might be a, a you know, formation, a significant, deeper formation, theological education, and then service in the church in, a, in a, a particular capacity. But for others, it's in day to day life. It's in the in the family. It's in the in the the job, the workplace. Where is that being made manifest in those particular moments and in those particular places and spaces? So I, I think it's 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 there are those who think, well, what is it that I have to contribute? And yet everybody has something that they have been gifted with. Oftentimes they just don't realize what it is. How can we help them to discern? Absolutely, Father Frank. And, you know, with, with YCP, we offer mentorship. And I think that's a huge piece of it is, uh, you know, especially for young people, they have a lot of questions and they're really just looking for guidance and looking for someone who will practice with them, um, kind of share some 
challenges that they might have had. And I think it, through that conversation with someone that you trust, you can explore a little bit and, and say, where is God calling me to use my gifts, my professional skills, you know, my charism? Um, so I think it's it's mentorship, you know, uh, young people to older Catholics, but also peer to peer, um, just people getting to know each other. And then just one other just kind of anecdote. Um, I recently got together with a young priest at my parish and invited him over to our house. And I said, what's been your biggest challenge in your first year in your priestly ministry? And he said, I've been surprised um, that the people don't know that they can invite me to things. Um, and so he just kind of commented a little bit on loneliness. And I think, you know, we need to really reach out right now in this world. We need to invite our pastors over and get to know them, our priests. And then likewise, the priests need to get to know us. And I think in that way, through relationship, Paul, like you said, um, we can really help each other discern our gifts and discern where God is calling us. Thank you very much. And, I, and actually, so I'm conscious that we're near the we're the, near the next top of the hour. Um, but I want to take a cue from Jennifer here um, and ask. So one of the things I've enjoyed about what Jennifer has done is she shared some stories, uh, some experiences she has had, um, how she's kind of understood the importance of, in, of the mission and ministry of lay people. And I'm wondering if I could invite um, our other panelists to also share a story or two that you may have um, about when you explain and explore the importance of the mission of lay people in the church, is there, is there an incident, is there an experience, a story, a relationship that you've had that would be very hel helpful to kind of encapsulate all that we've been talking about here? Um, and uh, I, not realizing that you all got to think of that story, uh, I'll, 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 uh, is there someone who, who has one at the top of your head that you would like to start with? And then we'll go around. If I could um, give a short little story, but I, I'm going to have to jump out because I have to get to a confirmation. Uh, well, there, there'll be many stories to tell from there. So, uh, but, but I have to say Jennifer is one of them, right? You know, to me, Jennifer is somebody that uh, felt a call deep within her heart. Um, and that, that, Paul, as a lay person, right, drove her to leave professional life in the in, in the secular sp sphere, which has then catapulted to gatherings of young adults and I've experienced it now twice, right, in Cleveland and here, right. To me, that's a that's a powerful story, right. That somebody within the silence of her own heart felt of wanting to do something for young adults and particularly in that professional uh, sphere and and went for it without really knowing what that was going to involve and actually put a lot of stuff on the line because she left her job most people don't do that right they do it you know after seven you know and on saturdays so thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Archbishop. And so I, I'm going to have to bow up because I have to go do my thing. But God bless you. <laughs> thank Bye. you, Archbishop. Hoffman, do you have a story? brief story here, and this is pre-COVID-19 uh, times, you know, our parish uh, every year uh, used to run a stewardship fair, you know, and we, we invited people to come uh, and, and, and engage in some of the ministries that we had in the community. And the way we did it, you know, we, of course, you know, developed a list of the traditional ministries that we have in the church. We needed catechists, we needed extraordinary ministers of communion, we needed lectors, we needed people who would uh, be ushers and so on. And then, but we always left, you know, a blank space and we asked the question, what do you know, what do you want to do in the church? And some people got curious about that, you know, and some people said, can, can you help me with this? And we said, so what would you like to do? And some people said, well, I actually like to cook, you know, and then we have a meal center. We feed 500 people every day in the meal center of our parish. That's their ministry. 
some of them, some people said, I know, uh, some ladies said, we know how to sew, you know, and they do some sewing for the, for, for the, for the ma matters related to the liturgy and, and the parish. And there are some people who say, I know how to teach RCIA and, and I have theological background. I have degrees in this or that, I can do this. I think that that's perhaps the most powerful way, you know? I mean, the, when we start looking at ministry, you know, as an ac action, as an activity of the baptized person in the name of Jesus, you know, cooking, teaching, witnessing, preaching, you no, know, doing all these things, that's ministry. That's the, that's the apostolate to which we are called, you know, that's how the world is transformed. Sometimes people think, you know, we need more people with doctoral degrees and master's degrees. Yes, welcome. I welcome them. And actually, I train many of those, you know. But I also want people who, you know, in their everyday lives, you know, in the name of Jesus, are transforming their neighborhoods, are transforming their families with the little activities. That's ministry, I believe. Thank you. I think for myself, when, when I look at, at the, the different, because I've, I've worked with part-time and collegiate campus ministry for the last almost 25 years, and I've just seen, and also in teaching undergraduates, and just see the, the way in which people start to make those decisions about their lives and about taking this vocation of baptism and then living it, and then making particular choices around that. It could be in, in aspects in ministry, in different ministries within the church. It could be just, it, it, not just, it could be apostolate in everyday life. It all depends on where a person is finding themselves. But there's that need for, and Jennifer used the term, uh, the term mentorship. There's that need for accompaniment, that need to walk with, to journey with together. And so that that people can can come to what it is that they're, that their particular moment in life, and it'll change at different points in life. I watch people's lives over, over these years, and even in my own life, things have changed. And But we need one another as church in communion with one another so as to be able to go forth on, on mission. And I think that there's just such a, a beautiful array, and again, a very positive way of putting this, but I've just seen it play out. When we don't do that, when we block, when we don't invite, when we don't allow for participation, when, when people's charisms are not respected and, and invited in, uh, what happens is, is that it, it, the, it's not fruitful and things start to die on the vine. And I think we see that in various places. So the opportunity to be fruitful. Thank you. Jennifer, I know we asked every, you kind of inspired us, but do you have any, uh, a last thought there? You know, I, I've shared some great stories and I, I just have so many about, you know, young people with just a simple invitation, you know, have have come alive in their faith. Um, and I think, you know, just again, talking about young people, people think it's so elusive. What are we going to do to reach young people? I mean, really, it just starts with a little invitation. <laughs> um, so, you know, I really want to thank uh, you all for this amazing conversation because um, I think if more people knew out there that we're on the same team, we have a great mission, which is, you know, trying to bring souls to the truth of Christ, um, then we would all just see how joyful it is to work together. You know, it's, it's pure joy. Um, you know, so I think that that's just it. Very, very thankful. Thank you very much. Um, we, we could go on for, 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 for hours talking about a lot of this, um, uh, but we don't have the time to do that today. But luckily, uh, this conversation doesn't actually have to end. Part of one of the reasons why, why the Catholic Apostolate Center and the USCCB Secretariat on the Laity have uh, worked on this, we have a series, which means that we're going to continue unpacking. And some of the questions that were even offered today we're going to unpack further with 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 some other uh, great leaders in our church, um, and so uh, our next one will focus specifically. We had some questions. Synodality has come up, and obviously that's the topic of the next international synod that will be going through over the next couple of years. So we're going to really dive a little deeper on that question uh, at our next session. Um, but I want to thank those who are here as part of this. Thanks for starting us off, um, and again. Not every question was answered. Um, there are still things that could be said, and that's good. We want to leave ourselves kind of wanting more, and hopefully you'll come back 
and we can continue the dialogue in a very hopefully synodal way to continue to listen to each other, to accompany each other, um, and together uh, find uh, where we where we were ultimately the Lord is leading us. So uh, thank you, uh, Hoffman. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Archbishop. When you watch this recording later, you get and you, you'll know that this uh, we thanked you. And Father Frank, um, I'm in incredibly grateful that uh, we've been able to collaborate on this part project and look forward to continuing to collaborate in, in, in any future years. But as our host, if do you have a, would you like to offer us a final word uh, and maybe a moment of prayer? Well, and thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you for, for facilitating and for, for all of those who participated. We want to thank you for being a part of, of this conversation. Uh, there's so much and so much richness to all that has been discussed and all that's been in the chat as well. And we know that we're just at the surface of this. And so we do invite you as to, to become part of this ongoing conversation, especially over the next year or so. So let's just take a moment. Christ is present with us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving and gracious God, you have been very much present in this moment of conversation. Help us to recognize all of the great giftedness that you have poured out upon all our brothers and sisters. Help us to be able to go forth for you, carrying forth your mission so that we may witness you in everyday life, in all that we say and in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. God bless. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.